Hello, Yoga Renew family. I hope you're all having a wonderful start to your day. If you're watching me live, welcome. If you are tuning in to the replay, thank you for watching. Um, my name is Kate. I'm the co-yoga director at Yoga Renew. If we have not had a chance to meet yet, uh, and I am so excited today to hop on here and be talking about teaching to different levels in your yoga classes, uh, which is something I'm really passionate about because I think when you appropriately teach to the level of class that you're leading, it makes the students in your class feel more confident, more comfortable, and like they're in the right place. And that is a better way to serve our students, right? When they show up and their expectations are met, that's half the battle with making sure that they want to keep coming back to your classes over and over again. And I think often as yoga teachers, we sometimes come out of teacher training and feel the need to like, make our classes crazy, creative, and interesting, and try to challenge our students and make them harder. And that can be really great if you're teaching a group of, of advanced students. But I know for myself, when I first started teaching, I felt like I wanted to do that because I wanted to teach like my teachers for my training, but I was teaching beginner level students. And sometimes that can make it feel inaccessible to them and off-putting because they come in feeling a little bit nervous and unsure of themselves if yoga is new to them. And then if all of a sudden they're not able to do any of the asana throughout the class, that can be a big turnoff and not only leave them maybe not wanting to come back to your class, but maybe feeling like yoga isn't a good fit for them. And I am so passionate about making sure that we do our very best to give our students a lifelong love, love of this practice, right? For a lot of our students, asana is the way in and the introduction to beginning to practice yoga. And then once they get comfortable with the asana, we can start to layer in all of those other things that make yoga so much more than just a workout, right? All of the philosophy and the pranayama and all of the other beautiful pieces uh, about this practice. So teaching two different levels is certainly challenging and it is a skill, but I'm hoping that a few of the tips that I have for you today will enable you to do this effectively um, in your classes. So pretty easy breakdown. Uh, I'm gonna go through in our opinion. So from me and Patrick and at Yoga Renew, really what we would consider the breakdown for the different levels in your classes, whether you're teaching a vinyasa style or a hatha style. Also some key things to debunk regarding teaching levels. And then I'll also talk about open level classes, which in my humble opinion are the most challenging ones that you can lead because you're kind of like, you can get someone who's like, it's my first class. And then someone's like, I can do headstand for 20 minutes and you have to try to make it that work. Um, so let's first start with breaking down what I would say the different levels of classes even are. So I think you have beginner level classes. And to me, those are people who have almost never been in a yoga asana pose before. It's their first introduction to yoga. Sometimes it's their first introduction to any kind of movement. They don't always have body awareness and can't even figure out left from right. And everything about moving their body, especially connected to their breath is totally new to them. That's what I would consider a beginner level class. A level one class in my opinion, would be someone who knows the names of a good amount of poses, but doesn't necessarily understand all of the alignment of how to do them and doesn't easily know how to transition between pose to pose if it's a vinyasa class. So Papa or vinyasa, I think a level one student has familiarity with the pose. So if you say we're going to come to tree pose, they know what that is, or we're going to come to downward facing dog, they know what that is, but they might not be very well versed in the alignment of those poses. And they need a lot more instruction to transition them between pose to pose. A uh, level two or intermediate student at this point is able to transition from pose to pose. They have a fair amount of knowledge about the alignment of the poses that they're moving through and are really looking for you to now take them past just alignment cues and focus more on experiential cues. So once they get into a pose, what should it feel like? What micro adjustments are they able to then make? And then a level three or advanced student, I think is two ways, either starting to work on some of the more very advanced asanas, arm balance, back bends, inversions, uh, like beyond crow pose, all the like one-legged crows and the ones where there's 
you know, legs over shoulders and all that kind of stuff. And or also talking about like very, very nuanced things in your standing poses, talking about how to use the poses to unlock layers of and the energetics in the body who are really moving more towards like a teacher training mindset that are trying to understand either very intricate physical poses or how to pull in all the energetic elements into your more traditional standing poses and things like that. So that kind of advanced mindset and way of looking at the practice. That's like the, the, I don't know, not timeline, like the, the, um, scope of what I would say. So you have beginner level one, level two, and then you're level three. So moving all the way across that spectrum. So how do we then teach to those different poses? Some very simple things and rules that we have that we use at Yoga Renew headquarters at our studio, Yoga Renew Studios, but that we also advise our students to use would be the following. For beginner level students, I think that you can consider those classes really focus on trying to just teach people the foundational poses, the poses they're gonna see in most yoga classes and just explaining to them like literally what to do with their hands and their feet and their arms and their legs. So going over things like how to actually sit in Sukhasana or Virasana, introducing blocks and props, moving them through sun breaths so that they start to learn that yoga is about linking your movement to your breath, going through your basic standing poses, triangle pose, warrior two, um, extended side angle, warrior one possibly, and then some simple balancing poses, right? So tree pose, warrior three, Ardha Shandrasana, half moon pose. And really with your beginner students, you're taking the time to teach them how to move their bodies into these poses. And sometimes it can feel a bit more like a workshop because you probably have to stop and explain things a bit more often than you would in the other classes. Um, for a true beginner's class, I almost like to structure them what we would call like a beginner series where we're like, Hey, everybody, welcome to yoga. Let's take a look at how to do downward facing dog. And then you're going to really talk them into how to get into the pose and what to actually do step-by-step. Step. So true beginner level poses, people who have never taken a yoga class before, I always like to recommend that they do their best to find a beginner series or take some time to ask teachers how to go through those foundational poses so that they learn what downward facing dog even looks like, what tree pose even looks like. And that's what I would say in terms of a structure for a beginner level class is really trying to teach people how to move through those foundational poses. Once you get into level one classes, I think that those require movement, right? So in a level one vinyasa class or a level one hatha class, a big misconception I think is that sometimes teachers structure them only as gentle yoga classes. And gentle classes are amazing and have a place like for teaching gentle yoga. But I think the key thing is that if it's a level one hatha or a level one vinyasa, that to me doesn't mean that it has to be gentle. It doesn't mean that it's a restorative or a yin class. I think the, if you're teaching a yin class or a restorative class, that's where that practice belongs. But for level one students, if they're coming to take a hatha or a vinyasa class, I think you still lead them through a strong practice maybe just at a slightly slower pace. So if you're teaching vinyasa for the way that we would structure it and what that means at our studios and classes means in a level one vinyasa class, we do not offer chaturanga dandasana or upward facing dog in any type of flow sequence. Instead, we bring students forward to plank pose, have them lower down to their belly, take cobra pose, and then move back to downward facing dog. So that's one key difference. Chaturanga is a pose that requires very specific alignment in order for students to do it successfully without hurting themselves. And in a level one class, students are still working on that. So to cue chaturanga through a vinyasa class a ton of times, students risk injury. So we actually don't cue those. Instead, we might teach chaturanga as a peak pose or something of that nature, but mostly cueing to allow people to lower down to their belly. Um, in a hatha class, it might look like really focusing on the strength of standing poses. So you might not do 
a bunch of chaturangas typically in a Hatha class, but maybe you eventually work in some sun salutation, still taking out chaturanga in that level one, but also really focusing on the core standing poses and core standing balances, but in a way where the poses are linked together. So in a beginner series where in like the very, very basic students, beginner students, you are assuming that they might not even know what downward facing dog is. I think in a level one Hatha class, you can assume that people do know what downward facing dog is, but now you're going to talk to them about starting to find more space, length and strength in those poses. So still taking a look at true, strong physical movement in those Hatha and Vinyasa classes, as opposed to making them gentle, but just pulling it back from maybe working in a, an extremely fast pace or very intricate uh, transitions. So from a sequencing perspective, maybe only doing like three poses at a time that are linked together so that students can begin to understand like the choreography of how to move their body from pose to pose. In a level one class, I think the cues are still focused on telling people what to do with their limbs. What do I do with my arms? What do I do with my legs? Right? How do I use my arms and my legs to move from pose to pose? and leading your level one students through that experience. For a level two student, as you start to get into more practice, people who have a little bit more familiarity with the poses, uh, at that point, I think you can start to offer in a vinyasa class, Chaturanga Dandasana into upward facing dog as part of the flow sequence. So one key difference, and then also start to link more and more poses together. So the pacing can pick up a little bit for a level two student, because if you say, from warrior two come to triangle pose, they know what to do at that point with their arms and their legs. You're still gonna cue using that, you know, straight in your leg, reach your arm forward triangle pose in order to be able to effectively move people through your class. But in a level two class, then once people are in the pose, I think you can start to talk about those more experiential cues. So things about in triangle, now that I'm here, how do I lift my navel in and up and wrap my ribs around to find more strength and length through my core so that I can open my chest more, right? So it's talking more about these nuanced things that we can do with the breath and smaller micro movements in the body to deepen the experience in a pose. And I think that requires a student who has a bit more familiarity with just moving between pose to pose. So level one, you're really, your cues are focused on just the how-to. How do I move my body from one pose to another using my arms and my legs? In a level two class, of course, you're going to go with those how-to poses to get people into them. But once people are in the poses, now you're going to layer in more experiential cues. The other key difference here is I think in level two classes, that's when you can start to work on some of the more challenging physical poses, doing full headstand, looking at handstand, looking at crow pose maybe some of those advanced variations of different arm balances or back bends versus in a level one class, you want to still potentially look at those, but do so with a lot more support using props, hands-on adjustments, things like that. And then if you're te teaching really advanced students, like level three stuff, um, which I don't think truthfully that happens that often outside of like leading teacher trainings where you're going to have like groups of students in that way, that's when I think you could start to almost like break down workshoppy stuff, but on, it's almost like back to the workshop style of a beginner's class, but maybe you're looking at like a full twisted headstand series and all these like really fancy um, poses. I don't like truthfully, Patrick and I, outside of teacher training, we don't really have a ton of, we don't have any actually like level three classes uh, on the schedule here at the studio, um, cause it's a very small portion of people who want to take those types of classes. But I think it almost becomes more of like a master class or a workshop type thing where you're teaching very specific asanas to those students. Okay, so quick recap. <laughs> Beginners, you're teaching them what the poses are. Literally what is, down, what is downward facing dog, what is tree pose, what is triangle pose. Level one, the assumption is People know somewhat of the names of the poses, but now you're teaching them how to link them together by explaining how to move their arms and their legs from pose to pose, whether that's a vinyasa or a hatha class. In a vinyasa style, no chaturanga, just lowering to the belly. In a level two class, now they have familiarity with how to move their body from pose to pose. So you can start to integrate some more 
faster paced, creative transitions and sequences and start to layer in that experiential work on the micro movements to find more room to play within the pose um, and connect it to breath. So that's how I would break those down. Now, in terms of teaching to those different individual levels, I think the key that a lot of teachers miss is, like I said in the beginning, showing up and teaching to the level of class that your class is labeled. So if you're teaching a level one class, that's what you've been hired to do, or that's what you've advertised your class is. Even if you can teach a level two, you don't teach level two, right? You teach the level one because that's what you have advertised. You might get level two students who show up to your level one. I would consider myself like a level two, level two, three student and practitioner at this point. I love taking level one classes. I love going back to the basics and having a little bit more groundedness and stillness and time to explore some of those poses myself. I'm not expecting the teacher though, just because I'm a, a level two student to give me all these like headstand variations as part of a level one practice. I'm expecting the teacher to show up and teach a level one class. And if there are students in your class that are level two students, they show up and they want to do a level one class and they want to like do their own thing, you as a teacher have to figure out what makes sense for you in terms of managing that. But don't put pressure on yourself to have to cater to people who are trying to go beyond what you're showing up to offering as a teacher. I think your job as a teacher is to serve your students and to do it in a way that is connected to what you have promised them and set the appropriate expectation. So if you if students are coming to your class expecting a level one class because that's what's been advertised, show up and teach them and deliver a level one class confidently and know that there's so much room for all students to learn in any level class. Like the most advanced students should still be able to learn something if they're taking more of a beginner style class because it gives them the time and the space to explore poses that maybe they haven't thought about, right, from that beginner mindset in a while. Um, so I think the key is showing up and teaching to the level that you have marketed and advertised. Now, all of that being said, what do you do with an open level class, right? What do you do when you're teaching at a place where they don't break classes down level by level, where it's just kind of anyone can show up? Maybe that's because that's what the gym, studio, community center, wherever you're teaching has chosen to advertise classes at. Maybe that's because you're working on building up your classes and you don't want to necessarily have to say, you want to get as many people as possible to come. So how do you basically combine stuff when you have all different levels in a class? In my opinion, the easiest way to do that outside of like true beginners, people who are like, I've never taken a yoga class before. Cause I think they really need to go through more of like a true beginner style class. If you have a mix of level one, level two students, I think if you're choosing to sequence, as we always recommend to a peak pose, you can choose to do a level two peak pose, but lead your sequence first sequencing the level one options with an option to increase the difficulty of a pose at a level two style, meaning something like in a level one class, if I'm going to teach um, revolved extended side angle, right? So like the twist where you hook your elbow outside of your front leg. In a level one class, I always cue that where I say, step to a low lunge, tap your back knee down, take your hand to your thigh, hook your elbow, find the twist, breathe here. And like, that's it. So the back knee stays down the whole time for me when I teach that in a level one class versus in a level two, I then say like, lift your back leg. Maybe you open your, your arms. Maybe you take your top arm over your head. So in a level one, I would only cue with the back knee down. In a level two, I would always cue with the back leg lifted. In an open level class, I would first cue the level one option. So step to that low lunge, tap your back knee down, hook your elbow, find your twist. Then I would say, if you'd like to take this a little further, tuck your back toes under, lift your back leg. Maybe you open up your arms, maybe you reach your top arm over your head. And now this gives your level one students a place to stop and stay. And then it gives your level two students the option to take it a little further. This is very different than first cueing the level two and then backtracking it. And I wanna explain the difference here. 
Again, I think the goal as a teacher should be for you to make sure that every single student who takes your class feels comfortable and confident and taken care of and seen. And whether we understand it fully or not, people come in with insecurities and want to feel like they're able to keep up and do what you're asking them as a teacher. It's a different feeling as a student to have a teacher say, step forward, keep your back leg lifted, turn, hook your elbow, open up your arms, take your time arm over your head. If you can't do that, then just leave your hands in prayer or put your palm or put your knee down, right? That, that phrasing of like, this is what I want you to do. But if you can't, here's how to make it easier. It feels really different than presenting the level one option first. Hey, everybody, put your back knee down, find the twist. You can stay right here and breathe. This is a perfect place to be. If you'd like to take it up a notch, feel free to lift your back leg, open up your arms, reach your top arm over your head. Either option is great. So you're teaching that you're presenting both options in either scenario. But the difference in an open level class of first cueing the level one and saying like, this is really where we're all going to be. If you want to go further, take the choice, but you're totally good here in the level one. Feels still inviting and inclusive and like you're seeing all of your students and presenting them with this option of where we can all be versus teaching a level two and then making level one students feel like, oh, you can't do that. Like, go ahead and back it off. So in terms of teaching open level classes, my advice is always cue it like a level one with level two options, but you can still choose to work on level two poses as a peak pose and just make sure that you give stops along the way to allow students a place to work. So that might be that you offer tripod headstand as a peak pose, but you first teach tripod headstand prep. So option one today, you can take tripod headstand prep and you cue everybody in how to do that. If you want to play with the full version, knees come into chest and your legs lift over your head and now you can take you know full tripod headstand. I think the success of an open level class comes from the way that you approach it as a teacher and making every student feel like there's a place for them to work. And I think oftentimes where teachers struggle is jumping straight to trying to teach to the most advanced student and then feeling like there's a lot of people who can't keep up and that starts to create some chaos. Students who have an established yoga practice, they remember what it was like to start, right? To be a more beginner student. And so usually they're totally happy to hang there. And if they want to increase the difficulty of some poses, they can do that for themselves. Versus someone who's brand new or newer doesn't know how to modify things to make it easier for them. So as a teacher in leading people with different levels, if you show up and cue to your newer students, you're going to serve all of the students in your class in a much more beneficial way than if you try to cater only to your students who have a more advanced practice. Um, yeah, so that over time is what I have found. I like for real, real, I think teaching open level classes is some of the most challenging thing that you can do. Uh, it's super hard because you just never know who's going to show up. Like you never know if you're gonna have four people that are like, oh, I wanna do drop backs at the wall and practice full wheel. And someone who's like, I've never done bridge pose before. You know, the, the span of experience can be so challenging to lead as a teacher. And I think as long as you show up with the intention of trying to make everyone feel seen, feel comfortable and feel like you're there to, to serve them and take care of them, you're going to be successful. And as a general default, always some like last kind of tip to share is have a few things in your back pocket of places where people can like stay and be and breathe if they choose. So offering at the beginning of your class, having everyone come to child's pose and just saying, if at any time you need a reset, please feel free to come to child's pose during this practice. Or I always think like when we're working on a peak pose, if it's a challenging arm balance or back bend or a uh, inversion, having everyone say like, if you're not looking to do any of this with us, grab a block, put it under your seat, come to sit in Virasana, hands in your lap, eyes closed, focus on some meditative breaths. 
just being able to give people and cue it in front of everyone, a place to work makes them feel more successful. Cause it's like, okay, I don't want to go upside down or I don't want to try that arm balance, but the other alternative is I can sit here and I can just breathe. And the teacher said that, and that's okay. So I don't look like I'm doing something weird, you know? Um, it's a crazy, it's a crazy experience as yoga practice. Cause I think as teachers, we feel like it's the most inviting thing. Once you've gone through and decided to do a yoga teacher training, you have found magic in this practice in some way it has changed your life and you love it so much. But if you remember back to the very first time that you tried a yoga class, I mean, I can share that for me. I was like, what is going on? You got people like balancing on their hands and crow pose. And these people over here are oming. And then I'm laying on my mat in Shavasana. And I'm like being told to share a room with a bunch of people with my eyes closed and to lay and breathe. Like it, it feels foreign when you're first doing it and it can feel nerve wracking. And that experience of like, I don't really know exactly if I'm doing things right. And for us as teachers, if we can show up and, and hold space for people through those beginning stages, um, you can create a lifelong love of this practice for, for people coming to your class. And that's a beautiful gift to share with them. So I think that wraps it up in terms of my tips on how to kind of cater to different levels. I hope that this was helpful. Um, if you have questions, feel free to comment below and I will look out for the, the, the comments and, and do my best to make sure to respond to everybody. Um, also let Patrick and I know we're gonna be jumping in to do more Facebook lives, Instagram lives. If there's topics that you would love for us to cover or that you have questions on and want us to share any insight on, we are always open to hearing that. Um, I think that's it. I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day whenever and wherever you're watching this from. We are so grateful that you are part of our community. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you as always. And I will talk to you again soon. Bye everybody.